Welcome back to the Art of the Matter and to the third week of Advent. The Gospel for this Sunday once again concentrates on John the Baptist, but since we focused on John and his ministry last week, I've made the executive decision to skip ahead to next week's scripture, which deals with Gabriel's annunciation of the good news to Mary. There's so much art that deals with this most wonderful of all events that I'd like to spend two sessions on the subject. Actually, I could probably spend a year on it and I wouldn't begin to exhaust the subject. This week, we'll be looking at the ways in which painters of the Italian school approach the subject. And next week, we'll consider how painters of the Northern school treated it that is, the Netherlandish countries which now constitute Belgium and Holland. The two schools diverge in very significant and interesting ways, so I hope you'll allow me this slight leap forward in the texts assigned for the upcoming two Sundays in Advent. The story of the Annunciation is told in the Gospel of Luke in the following way. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month for no word from God will ever fail. I'm the Lord's servant, Mary answered. Let it be unto me according to your word. Then the angel left her. It's become traditional amongst art historians to discern four distinct phases of the Annunciation which accord with the key verbs that describe Mary's various reactions in this passage. You'll see the distinct phases highlighted in red. First, Mary was greatly troubled by Gabriel's unexpected arrival and particularly his greeting. You who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Second, she wondered, which is to say she pondered and reflected on what exactly this greeting might portend. Third, she interrogated the angel. Mary asked, how can this be since I am a virgin? And finally, number four, after Gabriel has fully explained the momentous offer that God is making to her, the proposal he is making, for God is not forcing anything upon Mary She's free to choose to say yes or no to God. She accepts. Let it be unto me according to your word. I've characterized these phases as agitation, reflection, interrogation, and acceptance. And I've listed their traditional Latin names assigned by art historians as well. There is something of an artistic code of gestures which is used to indicate which phase of the process is being shown to the viewer by the artist. I'll give you examples for each phase and then we'll discuss some of this in greater detail. 
First of all, agitation. This initial phase of the Annunciation is indicated by Mary drawing back from the angel in fear. This is Simon Martini's version from 1333. Other traditional elements are included. The vase of lilies, symbolizing Mary's purity. The presence of a devotional book in her hand that symbolizes her religious piety, devotion, and the fact that she was literate. The dove of the Holy Spirit coming down in the middle, surrounded by winged angels. And a portion of Gabriel's greeting in Latin, printed in gold. Hail, you who are full of grace, God is with you. Often it is the angel who proffers the lilies, but lilies were the symbol of Florence, and Simon Martini was from Siena. Florence was Siena's arch enemy, so instead of holding out lilies, the angel extends an olive branch. Mary's blue robe indicates that she is the queen of heaven as does her throne. The red dress worn underneath the robe foretells Christ's passion and death. You will find most, if not all, of these symbols in images of the Annunciation. But what is clear here is that Martini has chosen to paint an agitated Mary, recoiling in initial fright at the appearance and message of the angel. More than a hundred years later, we find Sandro Botticelli, who came from Florence, painting the same initial phase of the Annunciation, and the angel now is featured carrying a lily. Mary has been busy reading her devotional book at a lectern, and she is wearing the traditional blue cloak and red underdress. Her body sways in an extraordinarily graceful, rhythmic way, away from Gabriel, while at the same time, she reaches toward him, a perfect expression of ambivalence. We'll have more to say about this painting in a moment. The second phase of the Annunciation is often shown by Mary pressing one hand toward her chest and the other reaching out with the palm open, as Fra Bartolomeo shows us here. We'll talk about this again in a moment. But note that God the Father is launching the Holy Dove of the Spirit in the upper left corner, that the angel bears a lily, that Mary's prayer book is visible and open on the table in the lower right, and that she is wearing the customary blue and red color scheme. The same phase of reflection is indicated here by Francesco del Cosa, although this time Mary simply puts one hand toward her chest as she bows her head in thought. We'll have more to say about Cosa's painting in a moment. The third phase of the Annunciation involves interrogation, Mary questioning Gabriel about how she could possibly bear a son, let alone the Son of God, since she is a virgin. That is indicated as here by a single raised hand, palm forward toward Gabriel. Note the traditional lily in Gabriel's hand and the devotional reading on the lectern before Mary, dressed in her blue and red robes. This painting is thought to be Leonardo's first work that was executed entirely by his own hand. Previously, as he worked as an apprentice in Andrea Verrocchio's workshop, he had only been responsible for small portions of a picture, which was later finished by the master. Again, we'll return to this in a moment. Finally, we come to the phase where Mary indicates her acceptance of God's offer. She does so with her hands across her chest, as we can see at the top of this large altarpiece by Piero della Francesco. This is probably the gesture most frequently depicted by artists, that of acceptance. If we move in closer, we see that Piero has executed the lower portion in a traditional Gothic style, characterized by the Gothic arches and the heavy use of gold as a backdrop. But the top portion, where the Annunciation occurs, is very much a product of the Renaissance. 
and in fact appears curiously modern. This is a very spare, almost Spartan annunciation, missing many of the familiar elements, but we do have the dove of the spirit, as well as the devotional reading in Mary's crossed hands, and she wears the colors which have become characteristic for her, the blue and the red. We'll return to Piero's work in a moment. So now you know what to look for when you see Italian Annunciation scenes, all the various phases Mary went through on her way to saying yes. Agitation, reflection, interrogation, and acceptance. I wonder if God and all of heaven stopped and focused attention on this utterly unique, totally pivotal moment in the history of the universe. Did waiting for Mary's yes seem like an eternity to God? And did it not seem an eternity for all the world that had waited so long for the coming of the Messiah? 400 years of silence for the Jews without even a word from the prophets and promises going back to Abraham and beyond him to Adam that one day a second Adam would come and everything would start to be put right. How long had humanity waited, as the hymn puts it, in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth? I think this sense of all time and space stretching out and straining toward this moment in which Mary must make a decision is something that fascinated the Italian painters. The knowledge of linear perspective of the vanishing point was just beginning to spread in Italy at this time. And to the mathematically inclined Italian mind, it must have seemed a very worthy tool to bring to bear on this cosmic intersection of the infinite and the finite. Where do parallel lines intersect after all? Only in infinity. This was a moment of such staggering paradox, the timeless entering time, the infinite entering our finitude, the immortal entering our mortality, the purest of light entering our profound darkness. The question was, how can the artist begin to capture all the paradoxical mystery of this moment? Let's go back, first of all, to Botticelli's Annunciation. The longer you look at this marvelous work, the more your eye is drawn by the perspective lines formed by the tiles and the strict lines of the molding that frame the door to this wordless but oh-so-eloquent space between Mary, who reaches but shies away, and the angel, who hovers in total suspension, quite literally, for a reply. The possibilities that might arise from her response are indicated by the vista opening up behind Gabriel. First, there's the walled garden, symbolic of Mary's protected virginity. And then there is all the world that stretches out to heaven beyond. A tree of life seems to have sprung up to suggest all the wonderful possibilities that await, if only Mary will say yes. I think this is one of the most brilliant images Botticelli ever painted, the way it suggests so much by the simple void that is opened between two hands. Will the two worlds of time and eternity, mortal, and immortal ever touch. Fra Bartolomeo raises the same question, although not quite so brilliantly as Botticelli, by his use of perspective lines and a central emphasis on an open space between the hands of Gabriel and Mary. Mary is reflecting here, and even God the Father is literally held in suspense with the dove of the spirit in the upper left corner. Above the door is a grisaille image of Abraham 
about to sacrifice his son Isaac, but he is being stopped by the intervention of an angel. And right below that scene is being enacted a drama that may or may not lead to the birth of the lamb who will ultimately be slain, the perfect sacrifice. What will she choose? Leonardo's Annunciation, showing the phase of interrogation when Mary asks Gabriel how it can possibly be that she will bear a child, employs space in a similar way. Mary, in her moment of interrogation, is framed by the bold lines of the blocks of stone that surround her. But the blocks also point to a beyond, a space of possibility that extends beyond the enclosed garden where she lives, out into a vision of celestial mountains stretching to infinity, perfectly framed by the two tall Italian cypresses. Everything depends on whether she is willing to let two worlds meet, collapse the space between them by saying yes. But no one took the use of space and perspective to the heights that Piero della Francesco did in his Annunciation. This long, long moment, whether we are referring to the many thousands of years of humanity waiting for a Messiah, or the seconds that hung between Gabriel's proposal and Mary's response, is indicated by the seemingly endless archways between the two figures so exquisitely rendered in precise linear perspective, with the columns casting perfect shadows on the floor as light filters through them from the left. At the end of this long hallway is a slab of marble, misty gray, that stops our eyes gazing further. The answer has been given, and the chasm separating man and God is being filled. The Holy Spirit is close by, and his golden rays will soon penetrate Mary's body. But it has been a long wait, and Francesco del Cosa whimsically makes this point by introducing the most improbable snail ever painted, right on the edge of the picture plane between the world where Mary is thinking over her answer and the world where we stand, the viewer. This is a very quirky picture. Cosa's architectural structures defy all logic. There seems to be a space where Mary exists on the right, a space on the left, in the background, where a dog strolls in the street and onlookers in their second-story windows Peer outside. There are contemporary Italianate villas in this portion of the space, as well as an ancient brick building that is crumbling to pieces. Behind all of that is the world of heaven, where the small figure of God in the upper left is launching the dove of the Holy Spirit from his hand. And in another space entirely is the angel, who is almost as close to us as the snail. And he seems to be looking past or through a central column in order to behold Mary. I think this jumble of architectural and structural elements would have driven the perspective-loving, mathematically-minded Piero della Francesco crazy. But I love the fact that Cosa introduced this snail which, if you compare it to Gabriel's foot, seems to be enormous. The message that he communicates as he makes his slow way across the bottom of the picture, teetering on the edge between our world and the world of angels and holy doves and Mary and God the Father and an entirely imaginary stage set, is that this moment has been a long, long time coming. And as Mary stops to reflect, time stands still for a bit longer as all of creation and all of heaven await her decision. 
Next week, we'll take a look at how Northern artists grappled with capturing this astounding interaction between Mary and Gabriel and tried to suggest all that it might signify. For those of you who have the time and interest, I'd like to read you a poem by Denise Levertov about this exchange. But if you don't like poetry or if you're pressed for time, feel free to stop the video right now. The poem by Levertov is called Annunciation, and it comes from an ancient Greek 6th century uh, work called the Agathistos Hymn. We know the scene, the room, variously furnished, almost always a lectern, a book, always the tall lily. Arrived on solemn grandeur of great wings, the angelic ambassador, standing or hovering, whom she acknowledges, a guest. But we are told of meek obedience. No one mentions courage. The engendering spirit did not enter her without consent. God waited. She was free to accept or to refuse, choice integral to humanness. Aren't there annunciations of one sort or another in most lives? Some unwillingly undertake great destinies, enact them in sullen pride, uncomprehending. More often, those moments when roads of light and storm open from darkness in a man or woman are turned away from in dread, in a wave of weakness, in despair, and with relief. Ordinary lives continue. God does not smite them but the gates close, the pathway vanishes. She had been a child who played, ate, slept, like any other child, but unlike others, wept only for pity, laughed in joy, not triumph. Compassion and intelligence fused in her, indivisible called to a destiny more momentous than any in all of time, she did not quail, only asked a simple, how can this be? And gravely, courteously, took to heart the angel's reply, the astounding ministry she was offered, to bear in her womb infinite weight and lightness to carry in hidden, finite inwardness nine months of eternity, to contain in slender vase of being the sum of power, in narrow flesh the sum of light, then bring to birth, push out into air, a man-child needing, like any other, milk and love but who was God. This was the moment no one speaks of when she could still refuse. A breath unbreathed, spirit suspended, waiting. She did not cry, I cannot, I am not worthy, nor I have not the strength she did not submit with gritted teeth, raging, coerced. Bravest of all humans, consent illumined her. The room filled with its light. The lily glowed in it and the iridescent wings. Consent, courage unparalleled, opened her utterly. Well, thank you for tuning in. Please continue to ponder the meaning and the wonder of this Advent season. Be well, be safe, be blessed. And I hope to see you all again next week.